right. Oop. Da, da, da. No. <laughs> All right. Are we here? Where am I? Where am I? What? You are there. I am here. Yes. <laughs> and uh, we're live. Good morning, everybody. How are you all doing? Huh? Woohoo! Ah, it feels like I can't believe I do this every week, but it feels like months since I do it. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna. I wish I had a week. That would be so nice. I wish I had a week where the only thing I could. I was. The only thing I could do was just record these videos. Like every day, five days a week, just like two sessions, morning, afternoon. And then in the evening, just have a drink and do some video editing and uh, and like finish the Grasshopper playlist, finish the C Sharp playlist. That would be so nice. <sighs> but unfortunately, I have a life <laughs> and several jobs. <laughs> so um, um, <laughs> not, not very possible at this point. Uh, I might be able to do that in August, actually. I have a week or two weeks before school starts that I have to prepare stuff. Maybe I can do that. The coffee, the coffee, I'll be right back. I'll be right back, right back. Okay, I'm back. Uh, sorry, I was just picking up my coffee. You've seen my mug. I like I like this mug so much. It's just so minimal and so nice. Oh, and you should see my coasters. <laughs> You're going to love them. Check it out. Woohoo! Can you see the pattern? Whoop! <laughs> and the other one. My friend Tiffany made this for a Kickstarter that she for a project that she built at Burning Man. And these were like, these were the, the, you know, what you send, Kickstarter supporters. Uh, <laughs> but of course, this is, have you guys seen the Penrose tiling? This would be a really, really nice um, geometry jam or video to do Penrose tiling. It's actually, it's actually not <laughs> very easy to do because it's an aperiodic tiling, which means um, the rules to populating those are... Um, well, it's a long story, but I'm going to go mute for a second because I need to change the batteries on the, um, on the microphone receiver. Uh, I'll be right back. Ah. Uh... me now can you hear me yes sound sound yes sound Ooh, all right oh I need to buy batteries I'm running out of batteries this thing this microphone is great except the fact that it just uses regular batteries you can't charge it with a USB or that's not very nice or sustainable um okay so oh, where are we what are we <laughs> where are we i am here yes okay all right so good morning everybody um things i wanted to say well, first of all, I wanted to apologize for yesterday. Um, I had a last-minute personal thing that I needed to attend to, and um, 
and I could I could just not jump on the on the stream. Um, so I had to postpone to today, which is not great because I mean Sundays should be for people, not for YouTube. Um, but I guess nine of you <laughs> still thought it was a good idea. So I'm actually very thankful uh, for those of you who are spending your Sunday morning, afternoon, evening, whatever, uh, with me. So uh, I'm very happy to be here, and I'm very happy that you are here as well. And uh, so that's why we pos we postponed for today. I also many of you has asked, many of you have asked me. Uh, I. Oh, Salvador, have you been using Machina at IAC? Are you at IAC? Oh, I may have forgotten about that. Oh, I think you mentioned in your introduction, right? Um, yeah, I think I think Machina is pretty cool. <laughs> but what can I say? I, I I wrote it, so. But yes, it's uh, it's. I think it's pretty fun. I'm actually hoping to use it this semester at at Harvard as well to have people remote into the robots that we have there and be able to control them remotely. Um, that's pretty cool. Uh, I see all familiar faces. Rodolfo, Andres, V, V, R, Salvador, Monique. Uh, how are you guys doing? Kartik, how are you doing? Uh, so, and as you know, I think you, some of you have asked me. I had a wedding. I went to a wedding ceremony last night. Uh, two good friends of mine. They had their wedding planned since I don't know when, for yesterday. Um, but obviously the whole COVID situation hit and they decided to just keep it. They decided to still get married. I thought, I thought it was beautiful. They decided to still get married. Um, so still do the ceremony, but just postpone all the celebrations and the, um, the, 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 the banquet and the eating and the drinking just to next year or whenever we're good. But they just kept the celebration. So they got married and it was on the outside, open doors. We were all super distant to each other. Everybody was wearing masks. Nobody touched each other. And actually, I thought it was a beautiful ceremony, but I came out really sad because I couldn't even hug my friends who were getting married, uh, which I'm, I, I'm just a little sad with this whole situation and a little tired. Like um, not being able to hug your friends who are getting married and then expressing their love to each other and not, you not being able to express your love to them as they're getting married, it's, I thought it was, I thought it was terribly sad. <laughs> but I guess that's where we are. Um, and I guess that's the new normal. Ah, yes, so, well, but we're here uh, and we're alive, which is what matters. And they are alive and their family is alive. So uh, we should be happy for that. Uh, Anyway, what are we doing today? So, um, I have two or three things that I want to do. Um, so, uh, remember, remember that I was making this introduction to Grasshopper playlist, and at some point I stopped because, like, it's really a playlist that I want to do real well. So. And these days I'm really busy with a lot of things, so I don't really have the mental space to just sit down and do nice uh, conceptual videos. Uh, so I, st I put a pause on that one. I will come back to that very soon. But in that playlist, um, in the, I, have I have already designed the curriculum and all the things that I want to cover. And in that curriculum of that playlist, there are um, theoretical lectures or more like like grasshopper the interface blah 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 whatever so teaching grasshopper and teaching parametric magnet through grasshopper and there are in the middle of the curriculum at certain points there are exercises to practice the things that um, people who are watching the playlist will learn through the playlist right so um, um, so those <clears throat> exercises I'm actually planning to do them as algorithmic modeling challenges like the you know when we when we did the Berlin Holocaust Memorial when we did the Umbrackle so it's exercises where it's not so much about teaching a particular algorithm but it's about teaching a way to model something right so I thought that perhaps doing a couple of the algorithmic modeling videos that I'm planning for the playlist 
I want to do them now so that I start having them. And whenever I complete the rest of the more like grasshopper oriented videos, I put together the playlist, I can insert those exercises in between. So what I'm going to record today is going to be one or two of those algorithmic modeling videos, um, which are going to be perhaps like a more beginner level uh, or more introductory level than the things that we have been doing, that I have been doing in the past previous weeks, which have been more like seizure based geometry algorithms. These are going to be more like basic grasshopper modeling uh, things. And this is going to be as basic as one of them is going to be modeling a pearl necklace. So just basically a curve with a bunch of spheres next to each other. And the other one is just going to be modeling a, a glass, a vase. Uh, so like a drinking glass, you know, so it's just creating two lines like this and then um, making revolution. I'm going to make those two videos. I'm going to make them in pure grasshopper in vanilla grasshopper and I'm going to make them, I'm going to record them in C sharp. Uh, the C sharp part will not go to the grasshopper version, but since all the algorithmic modeling that challenges that we have already are both plain grasshopper and C sharp, I think maintaining that structure actually makes a lot of sense and it's pretty good for people who want to move between them, you know? So that's what I'm doing today. Mm. So for those of you who are perhaps on a bit more advanced level, might be this might be a little um, boring perhaps, or maybe uh, it refreshes some ideas, I don't know. Uh, and then by the end of the video, so I did like very much uh, one or two weeks ago, I forget when it was, when I couldn't finish, when I wanted to do an algorithm but I couldn't finish it, when I wanted to do Chaikin's algorithm but I couldn't finish it, and then I left that as a challenge for you, the viewers, to complete. And then I got a ton of really good feedback and you guys enjoyed very much, like giving it a try on your own and uh, come up with a solution and then seeing how I implement it. And I already posted the video, uh, it's already up. So I had an idea about a challenge that we could do for next week. So what I will do is by the end of this video, so when I finish recording all these modeling, modeling challenges that I wanna do, I will propose that challenge uh, for those of you who may want to give it a try. And then next week, I will record the solution that I, I propose for this challenge. And remember that with everything, like with everything, there is not one solution uh, for a particular algorithm or for a particular geometry process. There are like tons of different solutions. Sometimes, sometimes it's just one. <laughs> but um, but uh, the, the solution is basically my proposal of how that problem could be tackled, which could be as valid as anybody else's. So don't take that as as written in stone or like uh, or like whatever you did is wrong and what I do is right. There's no such thing, absolutely. Okay, and then after that we can just finish with five or ten minutes of Q and A in social, um, as we usually do, and then we can take off for. I have really nice plans for tonight. <laughs> Uh, also at a personal level. So um, I'm very excited about that. So uh, I think we can get going with that. Um, I will post anyway, if you don't want to sit down for two hours and watch basic grasshopper tutorials, uh, I will post on the Discord, I will post a link to where in this recording of the live stream, where I announce the challenge for next week. And then, so you can check on the Discord in a couple hours, three hours um, for the challenge in the coding challenge. Let me actually, let me invite you, for those of you who may not be already there, let me share a link to the Discord. What are we? There you go. Uh, so if you're not on the Discord still, uh, we have uh, offline conversations and channels. We have coding challenges, live discussion, etc. I'm actually on the live channel right now. So if you want to share links of things, uh, I'm seeing it here right now. Um, and uh, and I think with that, we're ready to start. Let me set up a couple of things here on my end. Yes. And let me open right now. And let me open sketchbook because I will do a bunch of um, sketching. And it's really, really hot here today. You can hear the AC, right? 
while in the truck. <laughs> Can you hear the AC? Oh, my Rhino has expired. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> mm. Let me see. Let me take care of that for a second. One second. Yeah, that would not be great, huh? <laughs> that would not be great. Yeah, so I was saying it's very hot here today. Like, very, very hot. Um, and I have the AC on right now. But the other day I recorded a video with the AC on. And it sounded terrible. There was so much background noise. And... A lot of you suggested to you, like a lot of different software. What is my phone? I need my phone to verify. Damn. Where is my phone? I need to verify my identity. Oh, I just got the cutest picture from my niece. Oh, she's so cute. Oh my God. <laughs> she's so cute. Oh my God. <laughs> Sorry, I got distracted. Um, anyway, I was saying the AC, I, he I heard the noise of the AC on the previous video. And many of you suggested like software for background noise editing and reduction. The thing is, um, Rami and I, where is Rami? Are you there, Rami? Are you here? Uh, Rami has been helping me a lot with editing the videos uh, and we actually came up with a system that we can use. Um, actually, wait, let me show you. I, I think we made that open source recently. Did we do that? Uh, Rami, are you, uh, are you online? Are you listening? Are you hearing me? <laughs> okay, so if you go to the parametric camp github yes it's open source so if you go to the parametric camp github all right we have a project where we have all the um, sample files of, of of the tutorials that we record so here we have the algorithmic modeling ones here we have geometry gems here we have everything else uh, and in the gems you can see like uh, all the files and actually I forgot I have to add here um, your contributions Jim Monique I've seen you here yes you gave me permission I need to add your contributions here um, so what was I saying yeah so we have a system where we can take an edited file and just like chop it real fast and stitch it together so that we don't need to re-render the video um, it's a Python script basically that does that uh, and that saves us a lot of time and a lot of like the computer sitting down and like rendering the video for hours and losing quality actually that was the main driver we didn't want the videos to lose quality video quality by re-rendering them but the problem is that with that we basically cannot do video we cannot can we not we could just work on the audio and then just leave the video and then edit the noise cancelled video huh actually that could work i guess hmm i may have to take another look at that anyway um if you want a fast chopping and editing script written in python you can check this one camtasia to ffmpg camtasia is the software that we use to do the editing because it's really nice, very simple. You can just copy paste and the, um, on the free version just saves the file and allows you to do that. And then with the Python script, we take the file, we parse it, and then we chop uh, the video according to the editing that we do on Camtasia. Um, it's lossless, we don't lose quality, it's very nice. But what, I guess what I'm saying with this is that we can't do noise canceling because if we did, we would have to re-edit and re-render the video, which is exactly what we're trying to avoid. Uh, so my solution is going to be to, whenever I am recording the video, 
bang, just turn off the AC, sweat, <laughs> and then when I stop recording the, 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 the video segment, just turn it on again. Um, that's, that's as technology advanced as we get today. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, I'm derailing, obviously. I'm starting to derail. Um, Salvador, what is GSS? What is GSS? Uh, hey, Victor. Yeah, but that's the problem. I haven't tried RTXS. RTX. Actually, can you post a link to that? Can you post it on the live channel on Discord? Because I don't really know what that is. But if that, if that could help me just change the audio without having to re-render the video, then that may that might work. But um, I just don't want to have to edit the video. That's my, that's my whole problem here. Oh, I see you, Victor. Thank you. So what is this? Mm -mm -mm. NVIDIA RTX Voice mm. OBS Studio. Mm, I like this. Go to settings, audio, blah, blah, blah. Oh, interesting. Well, the thing is, the, the computer that I'm using right now to record uh, videos doesn't have an NVIDIA card because it's a laptop. <laughs> but I'm actually planning on, I'm actually planning on at some point, hopefully very soon, to buy a desktop computer because it looks like I'm going to be doing online teaching for a long time. So... So I'm, I'm going to buy like a beefy computer with a lot of NVIDIA GPUs and stuff. So maybe this could be, this is very interesting. Thank you very much, Victor. Um, yep. Thank you. Arasto. Um, so actually, if you're willing, if you're wanting to help with video editing, I am more than happy. Um, can you email me or text me, direct message me on Discord. Um, there's all, I always need help with video editing and that kind of stuff. So if you, if you want to join that, I will be more than happy. Um, <clears throat> Global Summer School. Huh, interesting. All right. Uh, so Kunal, Kunal and Alex, they're good friends, actually. Um, and I've been helping them put together the online Machina, Rick, uh, that was really fun. And I was, I was at, and I was at the, the, the final review that they, of the class they taught along with, um, Jose Manuel, what's his name? I forget. Um, but yeah, I'm actually, I'm, I'm very fond of the work that they're doing and their educational curriculum. Huh. All right, so, all right, you see, you're distracting me again. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm actually very happy to have live <laughs> interaction with people, you know. Uh, you can't take those things for granted these days. Anyway, what I was going, where was I? So, yes, so today we're doing two, hopefully two, uh, algorithmic modeling challenges. One is going to be a pearl necklace and the second one is going to be just a simple glass glass vase like a water glass like the ones you use for drinking a drinking glass um, so for each one of them what I'm going to do oh yes and by the end I will announce the coding challenge for everybody to give it a try this week and then 10 minutes of Q&A and social uh, ba -ba -ba so let's start. Let's get busy because I also have um, stuff that I need to do at 1 p.m. Um, so I need to, I have a hard stop at 1 p.m. So, all right. So what are we going to do? Pearl necklace. Um, but before, 
I start doing this, I'm going to re so I'm going to record the video is going to be an intro, um, then a diagram of the describing the algorithm, and then um, and then um, the implementation in vanilla grasshopper, and then the implementation and as, as a separate video uh, in C sharp scripting. That one will also be interesting. Uh, whenever I make a C-sharp playlist. Yep, those should be interesting as well. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, so I guess it's drawing board time. Where is my... So, I want you... What are we doing? We're doing the parallel. I'm a little. I'm a little distracted today. I don't know why. Uh, we're doing the pearl necklace, which means um, we're going to start off with a a curve like this one, for example, and um, and then for each that we're going to subdivide that curve into a bunch of points. this one and each one of those points is going to be the center um, of um, a pearl necklace that is going to look something like this 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 oh that was a terrible diagram <laughs> okay and what I want to explain here is that the parameters are going to be uh, the curve, the actual curve, and the number of the number of ugh, terrible and the number of pearls, and that from there we need to somehow figure out the radius of the pearl. And that that radius is going to be um, is going to be fairly easy to figure out because it's going to be if if we have the length, oh, ah. if we have the length of the curve, the length of the curve, um, and we have the radius of one of these pearls, for example, the radius of one of these pearls. Turns out that the turns out that um, the radius of the pearl is equal to the length of the curve divided by uh, turns out is that the length of the curve divided by the number of segments and this multiplied up, 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 up uh, and this multiplied by oh my god what am I doing now multiplied by 0 0.5 because it's the radius not the diameter um, I'm going to explain this very soon uh, on the video mm-hmm um, yes. Mm hmm Okay. So, and where is my mouse? Here. Okay, and... All right. And I see some activity on the chat. 
Uh, yes, Arasto, the, my Harvard email is is very good. Thank you. Um, you can you can find that online, right? Um, all right. So, okay. So we're starting by describing the algorithm. <clears throat> And remember, this video is going to be for beginners. So I need to remember that I need to assume that people who watch this video have never used Grasshopper. So I need to explain things like very, I need to break them down very easily because it's a very beginner video. Um, that's important to remember. And then AC. And now the noise you hear is the, my laptop, which is going to blow up. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So where are we? Yes, we are on the drawing board. <clears throat> and we're going to record. I'm recording, right? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, first things first, and as usual, it's very important that before doing any algorithm, before implementing anything, that we spend some time thinking about what we want to do and the rules about of what we're going to implement. And for that reason, um, I have this sketch here that I'm going to use to explain the rules of the algorithm that we're going to implement. Um, so if what we want is to... All right, starting over. Uh, <clears throat> okay, as usual, it's very important that before getting into writing any code or putting together any grasshopper definition, that we spend some time thinking through the problem. And then with diagrams and with drawings, it's actually very helpful to design what, to think about what we have as input parameters and what do we want to have as a solution and how do we go from one to the other. So in this, in this exercise, what we're doing is we're modeling a neck, a pearl necklace out of a, a curve that we have somehow in Rhino or in three dimensional space. So here I have that curve. And then um, another parameter that we're going to start with is going to be the, um, so we have the curve as an input and another one uh, another parameter that we're going to have as an input is the number of uh, pearls. So we know that we have we want the, the the necklace to have either one, ten, fifty pearls. All right, uh, and if that's the case, then the problem comes um, to what do I want to say? Oof, yeah, I'm not feeling it today, huh? All right. Let me start over again. <clears throat> uh, maybe here I want to create a new layer and call it inputs. Inputs. Inputs are going to be those, yes. All right. <clears throat> okay, so let's get started. But before, um, before we get into implementing any code or like throwing in any components in Grasshopper, it's very important that we spend some time thinking through the problem, thinking through what we have as inputs and what is the process that we're going to follow to get to the result that we intend. So here um, in the, the problem is we want to design a pearl necklace and that is going to be populated over, um, for example, a curve that we have in Grasshopper, in Rhino, from whatever. So in that case, we have to think that our inputs are going to be a curve. So we do have a curve and we want to put a lot of um, pearls, so spheres on top of them. And the other input that we're going to work with is the number of pearls. So how many pearls do we have? in this pearl necklace. And what follows is that if we also assume that um, that this neck, 
these pearls are going to populate the whole curve, then the question mark that we have right now is how big should those pearl, mm, pearls be? How, what is the radius of each one of those spheres that we're going to populate over the curve? Um, so the process that we're going to follow is going to be super simple. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to divide that curve in an amount of points equally distant to each other, an amount of points that is going to be equal to the number of pearls. All right. And then we're going to place spheres on top of them. But uh, what we need to know first is like how big those spheres are going to be. And for that, we need to follow a simple rule to find the radius of that um, pearl necklace. And I'm going to give you like two seconds to think about that. So pause this video, think about how you would do it and then come back. Thinking, thinking, thinking. All right, enough thinking. <laughs> so the way to do this is going to be super simple, actually. Uh, if we have the curve, we can find uh, very easily, uh, we can find what is the length of that curve, all right? And then what we want to find is also, uh, oh, sorry, I forgot to populate the, the spheres on top of that. And what we want to find is what the radius of each one of these pearls is going to be. So what we can do is that it follows very simply that uh, the radius of that sphere is going to be equal to the length of that curve divided by how many pearls uh, do we have in in the how many pearls do we have in the in the um, actually that is not correct because it's n minus one all right let me get back to that all right, so if we have this here, um, so let me just add another layer here. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then here, I'm just going to draw, uh, I'm going to extend this and I'm going to draw minus one here. Actually, why don't I just, um, why don't I just, okay, out. Why don't I just change this to, uh, and this is going to be N minus one. Um, and then multiplied by, Okay, so where do I pick it up then? Take three action. <laughs> so where do I pick up the video again then? Uh, I'm going to pick it up from the thinking, thinking, thinking. <laughs> uh, and I think what, when I was doing that, I was here. Yes. I think I was here. Okay, so I'm just going to start there. <clears throat> All right, so where were we? We were thinking, thinking, thinking. All right. Thinking, 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 thinking. All right, enough thinking. <laughs> so it's very, it's going to be very simple. Uh, if we have the curve, from that curve, we can calculate the length. All right. And then if we have, for example, um, five, five pearl necklaces on top of this curve, what is very simple to find to, 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 to see that the radius of that, um, of each one of those pearls is going to be the length of the curve divided by the number of pearls minus one, because uh, imagine you have five pearls, what you want is you want to divide the curve in four segments because four segments are the segments that are in between five elements. Just as you, just as if you had three pearls, what you would have is two segments between those three pearls, right? Uh, and then we're going to multiply that by 0 0.5 or divided by two because the radius is going to be half the distance between those, um, because, between those two points. All right, so it's going to be a very simple numerical rule, this one here. 
Uh, and you're going to see that implementing this in Grasshopper is very simple because we do have components that give us the length of the curve, that subdivide a curve into a family of points, and we can do this numerical rule very simple. Okay, so let's give it a try. Oh my god, it's so hot. <laughs> this is painful. Okay. Ooh. Let me save this. Okay. Uh, and uh, all right, let me switch to here. Um, and then let me place some bifocals somewhere here. Uh, let me turn off profiler. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to draw a curve in Rhino. I'm going to bring it into um, I'm going to bring it into Grasshopper, and then from there I'm going to do the two things. I'm going to sub I'm going to place two sliders. Those are going to be my inputs, and then I'm going to perform the process of subdividing the curve into a bunch of points, and then calculating um, that, calculating the radius of the necklace of the pearl, and then just drawing, creating the spheres. All right, that should be simple. Bye-bye, AC. <laughs> cool, let's get hands-on. So what I'm going to do is, on the Rhino side, I'm going to come here and I'm going to create a point from control points. So for example, something like this, like this, like this, like this a curve that I could use as the baseline for my pearls, right? Uh, I can rotate around here and you can see that right now it's a planar curve, but I could, for example, just take one of these points and drag it up and I could make this curve volumetric. So I could give it like spatial, um, which we don't need, but, it, but it's totally fine. The algorithm is gonna work anyway. And then I'm going to come here and what I want is to bring my geometry in Rhino as an input into Grasshopper. And the way to do that is by using the primitives, so the parameters. So here in the first tab, in the parameters tab, if I go to geometry, you can see that I have all these empty boxes here that can hold information either passing through it or manually loaded from Rhino, which is what I'm going to do right now. So here I'm going to go to the curve parameter. I'm going to drop it here. And then you're going to see that right now it's orange because it's empty. It has nothing flowing through or it has nothing loaded into it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on here. I'm going to do set one curve and then Grasshopper goes away and here is asking me to add, to choose the curve that I want to reference. As I click on this curve, right now this curve has been referenced into this component here. And from now on, I can use it down uh, as, an, as a parameter, as information that I can use in Grasshopper. And you can see that if I drop a panel, and I connect it to the curve, I can see that I see my reference curve. I could also empty this, so clear values, and now it's just not referencing anything. I'm going to undo this and bring back the curve, okay? So that's going to be the first parameter in my grasshopper definition. The second one is going to be the number of pearls. And for that, I'm going to need a slider, so I can go here to input, number slider, and drop uh, a number slider here, the only thing that I would like to do is I like to customize a little bit this slider because by default, they go from zero to one with three decimal uh, spots. And um, for uh, the number of pearls, this doesn't really work because I know that I probably want more than one, that's for starters. But also most importantly, I know that the number of pearls needs to be an integer, it needs to be a number with no decimal part. Uh, it doesn't make sense to have 1.23 pearls on the necklace. So I want my slider to force the accuracy to be natural numbers, AKA integers. So numbers with no decimal part. And I'm going to move the maximum. I'm going to go, for example, for 100. Uh, also, I don't want negative because uh, it doesn't really make sense in this case. And now I have a slider here from zero to 100 that I'm going to customize also the name because it's just good practice. So number of pearls, for example, right? And that's pretty much it. Now, um, 
These are going to be the two inputs that I'm going to work with. I'm going to group them to make things a bit more clear. And now I think I'm ready to start developing the two parts of the algorithm that I described. One of them taking the curve and dividing it in so many points as the, 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 the number of pearls. And um, the other part calculating the radius. So let's take a look at that. Okay, I need one minute break. I'll be right back. Right back. Okay, I'm back. I can you hear me? Testing, testing. One, two, three. Oi, oi. Okay, so so let's get to this. <clears throat> the first part is going to be super simple. Uh, I'm going to go all the way up here to the curve tab, and in curve I have division and I have divide curve. This component, if we take a look at the component, this component takes a curve and divides it into equal length segments. So, and the inputs are the curve that I want to divide, how many segments I want to divide it in, and um, the split, uh, whether if I want to split at the segments or not. So for example here, uh, if I take this curve and I plug it in here, now I'm dividing it into 10 segments which gives me um, 11 division points. So, um, so, and then you can see that if I scroll this over, I get more or less points, all of them being equally distributed along this curve, all right? So if I wanna be very rigorous about this, I need to keep in mind that since this component divides the curve into a, an amount of segments, all right? one, two, three, four, five segments. Right now, this component is giving me six points. And I can see that if I plug in here, I can see that it's giving me from zero to five, it's giving me six points. So that is not exactly the number of pearls. So what I will need to do is I will need to say, if I want five points, what I will need to do is divide the curve in the number of, in, in four segments, AKA the number of pearls, minus one. So what I can do is I can place here, I can go to the math tab, go to operators and choose a subtraction component that I will use and that I will use to take the number of pearls, subtract it by the, and, so, and subtract one unit from this value. A way to do that is I could choose a slider to put it here and then just set it to the value of one. However, I don't really like that because I feel that whenever there is a slider, then there is the tendency to move it around and change it. And I don't like this number must be one always for the algorithm to work. So I don't want any user accidentally changing this number and then messing with the result of my definition. So a very popular technique to do that is just using panels, not just for visualizing information, but for inputting that information. 
Uh, so I'm going to press drop a panel and write the value of one here and then plug that value here into the subtraction. We can see now that the output of this, of this component is the number four that I can plug in here. And then now I do actually have five points in my curve because I have divided it in four segments. Okay, so with that, I think we are good for the, def the, the division of the curve. I'm going to um, I'm going to group this, okay. And now I think um, I think we're ready to now try to figure out what the length, what the radius of the spheres should be. But before that, why don't we just place some spheres? So I'm going to place here. Um, sorry, this is from. You can go to the surface tab. You can go to primitives, and then here you can find a lot of different ways of. Uh, creating spheres. I'm going to choose a sphere from the center, like the basic one. Uh, and if I plug all these points here on the sphere, you can see that um, <clears throat> you can see that um, that now they're all placed on top of the curve. And that if I were to plug a slider here, I would be able to change the radii of each one of those. But I want the radius to be not some value that I choose. I want the radius to be a smart value that is coming from um, the relation between the, the pearls and the length of the curve. So that's why uh, I'm going to do some arithmetic to figure out what the radius of these pearls should be so that they don't overlap like this. Okay, so uh, and as per the diagram that we did before, this one, the rule is going to be this one that we have here. The radius of these pearls is going to be the length of the curve divided by the number of pearls minus one, which I already have there, uh, times 0 0.5. So let's take a look at how, let's take a look at how to do that. All right, I think, I think that n minus one may not be working anymore because here, um, we are subdividing by already by n minus one, so it's the length divided, or maybe it does work. Yeah, because if we subdivide, we still have to subdivide. If we have five elements, we still have to divide. If we have five pearls, we still have to subdivide the length by four segments. So that still applies. All right. <clears throat> so we're good there. <clears throat> okay. So now curve length, divide that by n minus one. Uh, and that's divide that by two. Okay. The first thing we need to do is we need to find the length of this curve. And that's also very easy. Uh, if we go to the curves tab, and if we go to analysis, we can see a lot of components that um, analyze and give you information about curves. Uh, one of them being, for example, length here. Uh, this component measures the length of a curve. So if I plug this here, and I plug in the curve that we already have somewhere here, right, then this is going to tell me the length in whichever rhino units I'm using of this curve. So if I were to now divide this number by n minus one, so the number of pearls minus one, uh, just like I have it before here. Uh, so I can take, I can go to math and I can do operators and I can do division or I can just double click here and type division. And I'm going to divide the length of that curve by n minus one pearls. That gives me a number that is going to be 2.69. And if I were to use that value as the radius, what we would see is that the pearls are overlapping on top of each other. And very interestingly, you can see that the overlap is actually almost exactly going and hitting the other point uh, where the next pearl starts. That's because again, 
um, that subdivision, that division that we just did, gives us the diameter. So the only thing that we need to do is we need to divide this number again. We need to divide it by number two, or we need to, so I'm going to copy and paste this panel here and just change it to the value of two. Uh, and that gives us this number here. And then that is the value that we should plug in here. We can also multiply it by 0 0.5, whatever both of those work. And now we do have the right value there. And very nicely, if we now change the number of pearls, you can see that the pearls start growing because they start adapting to the length of the, um, of the, um, of the curve. And if we start increasing the value, they also start shrinking because the value of the radius is now tightly, it's parametrically linked to the length of the curve. And you can also see this because if I were to uh, ridiculously enlarge this pearl necklace, you will see how the radius, how the size of all these pearls increases a lot as well. You know? Um, <clears throat> okay. And I think that's it for this algorithm. This is the calculation and this is the sphere. Um, and I'm going, yep. Yeah. So this is for this part of the algorithm. Okay. I think something that I want to talk about is the fact that this do overlap a little bit, that they're not perfectly tangent, um, <clears throat> especially wherever and I want to propose the alternative on how to do that so that they are perfectly tangent. Um, do I want to do that? I think I want to do that because it's nice. Um, so how am I going to do that? Uh, if we go to curve, whoop, if we go to curve, Divide by distance, preset distance between points. Uh, <clears throat> the thing is doing that on the C, on C sharp side is going to be, not going to be straightforward, uh, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing it here probably. Um, okay. So I think I want to, and I want to explain that uh, if we do that, then we are not, we can't know for real how many, we can't know for real the radius, right? Oh no, we know the radius, we just don't know how many pearls are going to be, because we can do this. But um, the distance is going to be whatever value. Um, I don't know. And this is going to be here. <clears throat> and if I now populate this here, these are the points, and this is the radius. Uh, and I show this. Well, they should be divided by two, of course. <clears throat> uh -huh. All right, and this is because of the curvature of the. Um, so maybe I should do like a like a. For this, I should do like a flat curve. <clears throat> um, maybe I can draw that on while I'm explaining this idea. Okay. <clears throat> All right, let's do that. One thing I would like to mention is the fact that uh, the algorithm that we have designed uh, roughly creates a 
pearl necklace where all the pearls are roughly tangent to each other, but they're not exactly tangent to each other. So it wouldn't be real in the sense that some of the spheres are overlapping on top of each other. And we can see that if, for example, right now the curve has volume. Uh, if we look at the top, you can see that there are areas where the spheres are overlapping with each other, right? Like just like here, here. And we could think that this is maybe because the curve has volume. So we're seeing the projection of that. But if I were to create, for example, if I were to create a new curve with a very ample curvature, but then here I have a very small kink, like a very sharp kink, and this curve is right now flat. If I were to do that, we can see that a lot of, you see all these curves are overlapping on top of each other, not only because of the proximity of the curve, but actually just because, um, just because the algorithm that we have designed doesn't really take into account um, when a curve is very, um, the angle is very acute. So in order to do this, there is a different method that we can use in Grasshopper for subdividing the curves. And that is going to be here under curve subdivision. Instead of dividing the curve among equal length segments so that this segment here is equal length as this one here. And therefore, that's why we have the problem. This point is too close to this other point. Instead of that, there is this other component called divide distance, where what the component does is kind of what the icon is showing. It just creates, it just finds the next point along the curve that is at a linear distance between the previous one. That means that uh, if we are, if we want all the pearls to always be tangent to each other, then that is what we need. We need linear distance between them. Um, so the only problem with this is that since we don't know the curvature of the curve, we will not, we cannot apply the same logic we just did. We cannot say I'm going to divide the length of the curve by the number of pearls and that's going to be the radius just because um, since we don't know the curvature, uh, where these points, where the centers are going to be placed along the line is not a, at constant lengths and therefore we cannot perform that division. So for this one, uh, the actual algorithm would be different. We would not start with the number of pearls. So we would start with the radius of those pearls and then however many neck, however many pearls pop up, it's just going to be a result of the shape and the length of that curve. So I'm going to plug in here the curve and then I'm going to create a new slider. I'm going to double click uh, or I'm going to go here. I'm going to drop a slider and I'm going to change this value from zero to, for example, 10 units. And I like the three uh, decimals. So I'm going to place that here. This is going to be the distance between those. Um, and this took a long time because it needed to perform a lot of calculations. I'm going to hide this, the points before. I'm going to hide these ones here. I'm going to do that by clicking with the middle mouse and disabling the preview, <clears throat> okay? And, uh, and now you can see that here I have all these points. I'm going to reduce, I'm going to increase the length a little bit, 10. Um, can you see how interestingly this point here, this one is very far away along the curve from this one, whereas the length of this segment is probably much longer than this one here. So if I were to now double click here, press sphere, so that I can place some spheres on top of these points. And what is the radius of those spheres going to be? It's going to be equal to the distance between these points, the linear distance, okay, um, divided by two. So I'm going to do a division um, here. I'm going to place a panel. So I do double, <clears throat> a shortcut is to double click and do two forward slashes. I can drop a panel here and I can divide this by two. And uh, this is the radius five. And if I plug that into the component, you can see that now, if I have a top view, you can see that all the pearls are perfectly and exactly tangent to each other, especially on the areas where, um, where there is like a weird curvature. Um, this would also not be real because the pearl would probably not, 
the cable, the thread going through them would not be uh, leaving the, the pearl, but you get the point. Uh, so if I were to do five, for example, you see that now linearly one after the other, this overlaps um, because they're in different uh, threads, but um, at least the one before and the one after is exactly on the right place. Um, and But you also so see that we always will have like a small remaining length after, uh, after this. This is just part of what the algorithm does for us or how, it's, uh, how it works. Um, we cannot control the three things at the same time. We cannot control the, the number of pearls, we cannot control the fact that they're perfectly tangent to each other and the fact that they fit perfectly the length of the curve. Those three are too many constraints for the algorithm that we have designed. So this would be one way of doing it. This would be um, the other way of doing this. Um, Okay, um, so I'm just going to change this. <laughs> okay, uh, and you see the remaining distance here. All right, how am I going to wrap up this video? Um, just to say that these are the two methods. Uh, one is going to be... Uh, <clears throat> given the number of pearls and this is going to be given the radius actually if this was the radius then I don't have to divide that no, this is the diameter uh, given the diameter Okay. <clears throat> okay. Okay, and this is pretty much it. Um, here we developed a, an algorithm to be able to populate a curve with a bunch of spheres given the amount, given the amount of spheres that we want to populate on that curve. And here we have another algorithm where what we did was we populated a curve with an amount, a variable amount of spheres, given the diameter of each one of those spheres and given the fact that we want them to be perfectly tangent to each other sequentially. All right. Uh, just as easy as that. Uh, in my follow up video, I would like to implement these algorithms with a C sharp scripting component. So if you're interested in that, make sure you, uh, you follow um, and you check out my next video. All right. Thank you very much. Oh, and if you want, please subscribe, like video, blah, 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 all those things. Thank you. Okay, let's, uh, let's, let's save this somewhere. Uh, this is going to be, uh, what day is it today? 26? Okay. This is going to be also all right. So maybe you can use the combo divide distance with divide curve as some kind of tangent target distance because divide distance divides exactly with the length and this leaves a spare curve at the end. Uh, you cannot combine those both. Um, it's either one or the other because. Uh, the, the thing is like, the more constraints you put on one end, the less freedom you have on other ends. So if the constraint is the number of pearls, then um, you can only distribute, you can only distribute them in a particular way, which is like equal length segments. If the constraint is that they have to be tangent to each other, then you are the one who must decide that. Uh, 
something that you can do is you can approximate. So you could iteratively say, okay, um, I want to divide this curve into these many, these many, um, these many neck, these, these many spheres. Um, oh, <clears throat> I'm a little dense today. These many spheres. Uh, this gives me a radius of so and so. And then I'm going to try now this algorithm with that radius and see how far off and then like start um, increasing or decreasing the radius. That would actually be a pretty good Galapagos exercise. You want to try that? Um, you want to try that? How can we try that? Um, should we try that? Um, uh, okay, so we have the diameter. So let's say we do, we do have, let's say we implement, ah, we're going to derail here. <laughs> All right, let's try this Galapagos. Um, so what we want is, um, first of all, let's say that, um, so what we want is, let's say we want a, let's say we want, um, let's say that what we want is, we have the curve, we want to measure how many pearls do we want, and we also want perfect tangency. And then the question is the radius. Then what we want to do is we want to fit as many of those necklaces uh, as many. Actually, Chandra, maybe you're right. Maybe this could be a nice coding challenge. <laughs> you're right. Very good, Chandra. We're going to do that. This is going to be a, a, a coding challenge. So I'm announcing a challenge. Let me go and do this. All right. <laughs> Let me announce the challenge formally. We're going to have two challenges for next week. First one is going to be. All right. Let me do this. Hody, challenge accepted. <laughs> no, no, sorry. Hody, I'm announcing a challenge for next week. So we just made this video where we implemented an algorithm to divide a curve in a bunch of spheres given how many per how many spheres do we have okay and no no it's not too late i'm going to i'm going to we're going to do this for next week so um i'm not going to do it right now i, I will do it next week uh so and actually wait so could we do this as also as an algorithmic modeling challenge huh should i Maybe we can do three parts. Maybe we can do the first one is vanilla grasshopper. Then the second one is like we explain Galapagos and the third one we do C sharp. That could be interesting. Hmm. That could be really interesting. Huh? Okay. So we're going to do this. This video is going to have three parts. First one is going to be uh, the plain algorithm. Second one is going to be C sharp and third one is going to be Galapagos. So solving this with Galapagos. Uh, and that one is going to be a challenge um, for you. So let me record, let me go back and record uh, a different ending for this video. <clears throat> uh, yeah. So let me record a different ending for this video where I talk about that. Ah, that's interesting. I like that. Thanks a lot, Chandra. Um, okay. <clears throat> All right. So this was the algorithm. As you can see, we implemented two versions of this. One were given the number of pearls, we were able to fit exactly that many pearls in the necklace with the problem that some of them did overlap because of the algorithm, because of the, because of the constraint that we wanted to fully reach uh, all the length of the curve. The other one was, well, if instead of that, we started with the diameter of the sphere, and then we also constrain those spheres to be always perfectly tangent to each other, then uh, we have however many 
necklaces can fit inside of however many pearls can fit inside that curve but we will always have some kind of remainder um, some kind of like leftover curve segment here so this problem uh, is a multi-constraint problem we cannot uh, fit we cannot control the number we can not control the radius and we cannot control the fact that they fit the curve perfectly uh, at the same time so um, actually this is this kind of situations where we have too many constraints can actually be solved by um, optimization and can be solved by uh, generative uh, algorithms so in part three of this video i will show you how to solve this problem by using for example galapagos which is an optimizer built in into grasshopper so um, this is the end of the first video the second one is going to be solving these two algorithms with c sharp scripting and the third one is going to be um, optimizing finding a generative way of trying to find a solution that approximates that multi-constraint problem uh, the fact that we uh, control the number of pearls and that we that they are tangent to each other and that there is as little leftover curve as possible so stay tuned for those ones there are going to be links here in the description and popping up and if you like this video make sure you subscribe you like etc etc thank you very much see you on the next one okay so now let me do this then um i'm going to announce the challenge Howdy, and for this one, it's going to be internal, so I'm going to turn on the AC. <laughs> All right. Howdy, and welcome to the new challenge for uh, next week. So if you guys are interested in doing some homework this week, uh, I just did this exercise where we modeled um, a pearl necklace. And uh, one way of doing this was having a curve and then populating it with a set number of pearls. The, um, so that all the pearls fit exactly all the length of the curve and there's no leftover curve anywhere. The problem with this is that part of the algorithm is that we are finding equal length segments between the center of the pearls, which means that at some point when the curve is very concave, then these pearls overlap, like here, here, or small here, you know? The other way to, the other way, the other way we implemented the algorithm is by saying, well, in this case, we're going to constrain the diameter of the pearl, and we're going to make sure that we do it in a way that there, all the curves, all the spheres are perfectly tangent to each other. They just touch in one point. Um, but if we constrain these two things, then we will never be, um, we will never know for sure uh, that there is no leftover uh, there is no leftover segment that we complete the full curve with all the pearls. So the way to make uh, add this constraint to the algorithm is by performing an optimization where we generatively, iteratively find solutions for the diameter of these pearls uh, by minimizing the leftover uh, of the leftover distance between the center of the lat sphere and the end of the curve. And that is something that we can do, for example, in Grasshopper with vanilla Grasshopper by using Galapagos. So the challenge for next week is going to be the following. If you're interested in this, take this file and see if you can change it so that by implementing Galapagos, you can find uh, for the curve and for a given number of pearls, you can find the right radius so that uh, the distance between the last center of the last sphere and the end of the curve is as small as possible. Um, we're not, I'm not going to say zero, I'm just going to say minimize that distance, okay? Um, so that's going to be the challenge for next week, okay? One, one of the challenges for next week. And I am on, where am I on the video recording? I am on minute 1.21. Okay, so if anyone can, anyone who's watching this can go to the coding challenge 
here and then paste a link to the video that I'm recording right now with the time what I said this um, and you can post it there so that people can uh, hear the challenge that we have a challenge uh, that would be great otherwise I guess I'll do it later okay so the next thing we're going to do is I'm going to implement uh, oh I'm going to record the introduction yes that's important <clears throat> Uh, uh, I'm going to Okay, yes, let me record the introduction well, Let me save this No Galapagos, but just the normal one Okay. <clears throat> Hi, and welcome to another algorithmic modeling challenge. In this one, um, what I'm going to do is given a curve that we're going to think of as the thread inside of a pearl necklace, I would like to implement an algorithm that populates that thread with a bunch of spheres that represent that those pearls on top of the thread. All right. Um, um, I'm going to do it in two different ways. One is going to be given uh, the set number of pearls. And what we're going to see is this, this algorithm uh, doesn't really quite um, make them fit perfectly to each other. They don't make them, it doesn't make them tangent to each other, but at least it fills up the whole curve all the way up till the end. Uh, so that's going to be one way. The other way is going to be by implementing an algorithm that where we control the radius of those spheres and we constrain them so that they're always perfectly tangent to each other in one point. Uh, with the drawback that um, we cannot control that they will fully uh, complete the whole thread. So there will be always some leftover curve uh, after those spheres. Um, so this video is going to be uh, a for beginners uh, in Grasshopper. So I'm going to assume no knowledge. Uh, I'm going to explain everything very carefully. And the algorithm is actually quite simple. We're going to be using like only a handful of Grasshopper um, uh, native components. If you're interested in a more advanced interpretation of this exercise, part two of this video will be how to implement these same algorithms using C sharp scripting. And part three, hopefully, will be how to, um, how to implement this in a way so that we can find, so that we can optimize iteratively, generatively, uh, this algorithm. And we can find a combination of the amount of pearls the radius of those pearls in and the fact that they're tangent to each other so that we minimize um, the leftover curve. Uh, and we're going to do that by applying optimization uh, using Galapagos in Grasshopper. So that will be part three of this video, right? So shall we get to it? All right. Oh, I see, Arasto. Yeah, I don't think we can get that timestamps until... No, I don't think we can get that until until the video is published. Uh, so don't worry, I'll, I'll post that um, on the challenges once the video is once the video is, is online. All right. Don't worry about that. <clears throat> okay, so what are we doing? Coding challenge minute? Uh, okay. <laughs> well, that's a good alternative. Thank you, Salvador. <laughs> Okay, um, so what are we doing next? C sharp, okay. So how are we going to do that? C and I'm going to write this here, C sharp. <clears throat> and um, I'm going to clear everything here. I'm going to clear everything here. And uh, 
I'm going to here. Finally, Galapagos is mentioned. <laughs> Thank you, Ricky. <laughs> well, you want to give it a try? Join the Discord and, um, and give it a try to do this exercise. <laughs> uh, okay, so C sharp. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to follow the same logic. Um, Uh, so I'm going to start by, uh, what am I going to do? I'm going to start by, uh, I'm going to load the curve, divide it into particular points, um, get those points, and then just find the length. Yeah. <clears throat> so just like we followed uh, with the previous. So, just following the diagram we did here. Okay. Um, drink some hot water or coffee. <laughs> yeah, I think I need that. I'm out of coffee. Mm. Um, and it's really hot here for hot water. So I could do. I could really use some cold water. Um, okay. <clears throat> So second video is going to be C sharp and I'm going to start by refreshing how we're going to deal with this. So the, the quick, very quick refresh of the idea. Okay, and then we move on to implementation. Let's get to it. But before a quick refresher, if you haven't seen the previous video, basically the algorithm that we're going to implement is we have a curve. And then what we're going to do is we're going to subdivide that curve into an amount of points equal to uh, the number of pearls that we have. Then in order to find the radius of each one of those spheres, we are going to find the length of that curve divided by the amount of um, segments between them. And then we're going to divide that by the value of 2 uh, or multiply by 0 0.5 so that we can find the radius of each one. And then we're going to populate um, all those spheres on top of those points. Okay? Um, let's do that. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> So, yes, so C sharp. Oh, I had the air conditioning. All right, I'm going to record it again. Okay, my friend Nono would be very, very disappointed if I had all that background noise. <laughs> He's really picky about audio, which he should, because audio is very important. <clears throat> Okay, but before we write any code, uh, let's do a quick refresher of what we did in last video. You should check the last video for the full tutorial. But anyway, uh, the, break, the basics of the algorithm that we're going to implement is that if we have a curve that we want to populate with spheres representing those uh, pearls, then what we're going to do is, first of all, we're going to subdivide that curve into an amount of points equal to the spheres that we want to populate. And then we need to figure out the radius of each one of those spheres. The rule is going to be very simple. We're going to divide, we're going to find the length of that curve. We're going to divide it by the number of pearls that we have minus one, because if we have three pearls, we need to divide the length of the curve in two segments, the two segments that exist between the three pearls. And then we're going to multiply that by 0 0.5 or divided by two, because that distance would be the, the, the diameter. And what we need is going to be the radius. So those are, that's the process that we're going to do. Uh, and in this video, as opposed to the previous one, we're going to write all of that in uh, C sharp using Rhino common and Rhino, and uh, using Rhino common um, to perform these operations. So let's take a look at how that could be implemented.
Okay, so, um, um, all right, so we're back here and um, now C sharp, okay? So how do we do this? Um, I'm going to first drop the component, explain the inputs, and then we get into the code. Oof. All right. For those of you who are not very, perhaps very familiar with C sharp scripting inside of Rhino, I'm going to go a little slow on this one. So the way we do C sharp scripting inside of Grasshopper is we go to the math tab and here where it says script, we can drop a C sharp script component. And this component is a component that as we double click, we can customize the code that runs inside of this component. Um, and we can use Rhino common, which is the library that comes with um, with Rhino that has like a lot of very useful and powerful geometry operations, uh, which are actually all the functions and all the operations that run inside of all the rest of the native Grasshopper components. So I'm going to drop it here and I'm going to customize the inputs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in and I'm going to right click where it says X and I'm going to change this to, for example, curve. Okay. So that's, I'm going to change the names and this one is going to be, for example, N, which is going to represent the number of pearls. And the other thing that is very important is that I need to right click on the input and make sure that the type of the input, the type of the object that is coming in is the right one. So for example, for a curve, it should be here under geometry. It should be a, an object of the type curve. And for N, it needs to be a number with no decimal part. So in programming languages, that is usually referred to as an integer. So that's here int. And then now I can just plug in here the curve. I can plug in uh, the number of pearls. And as I double click here, you can see that this panel opens and this panel contains a main function that is now taking in a curve object and is taking in an integer and it's spitting out A, which is going to be the result of our operation. So for example, the spheres, right? Um, I may actually want to rename that as well. And I'm going to call that spheres. So that now when I double click here, uh, I can see that the output is going to be this reference object called sphere. And at this point, I am now ready to start writing my C sharp code inside of this component. Um, so let's do that. And let's do that in two parts. First, Let's find all the points uh, along that curve. And the second one is going to be, let's populate those points with the spheres. Okay. Um, where are we now? Yes. So here. <clears throat> now I need a quick refresher. Um, I'm going to open Firefox. I'm going to do Rhino common, Rhino common, divide curve, uh, divide by count. And this gives me, mm, 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 mm. I'm going to zoom in, divide by count. Uh, wait, divide by count. And this one has 0.3D. Yes, exactly. It has a reference to uh, those points. Um, okay, so I think this is the one that I want to use. Okay. <clears throat> All right. First, let's, um, let's find the center points of the spheres. The way we're going to do that is by um, subdividing the curve, taking the curve and subdividing it into, um, into um, a bunch of segments. The idea here is that in Rhino common, there is this method called curve divide by count, and we can give it how many segments we want to subdivide this curve in whether if we want to include the ends or not. And we can pass in an array of point 3Ds that is going to be populated with all those 
centers of the spheres. Um, so what I need to do then is, first of all, I need to make sure that I have all of this data ready to go for the function, the, num the number of segments, whether it's to include the ends, and uh, an array to be filled in with the centers of the points. So first of, all, first of all, I'm going to create an array. I'm going to call it centers, and this is going to be a, an empty array. Um, do I need to declare that as an empty array? I forget. Uh, in the point, oh, sorry, point 3D. Yeah, I think this is fine. The variable centers is, is created but never used. That is absolutely fine. And then I need to also create a um, segment count. I'm going to create a variable called segment count, which is going to be how many segments I want to subdivide in. And that is going to be equal to the value of n, so how many pearls do I have, minus 1. Because remember, again, if I have three pearls, I want to divide the curve in two segments, uh, because those are the segments in between the three points. And now I think I'm ready to now say curve. Remember that this method that I just showed is a method that belongs to uh, curve objects. So what I can do is I can say the curve that I received as an input. Can I divide by count? And you can see how as I do this and I open parentheses, I have two overloads. One is going to be the segment count. One is going the, the second one being one that that I can use uh, <laughs> the one the two of them being one the two of them being um, both of them return a an array of double values that is where that is the value of the parameter where along that curve that point is found but the second one the second method just gives me the possibility of passing in the array of points and finding those points directly. So I'm going to say here um, segment count and then I'm going to say true here because I want the endpoints to be there and I'm going to pass in the empty array of centers so that it gets populated with, this, um, with these points. And just for the sake of giving this a try and see if it works, I'm going to add here a dummy output called A and um, I'm going to I'm going to write here whether if to render a I'm going to see if I, I'm going to output those centers on the e on the a output uh, and I'm getting an error here um, so I'm going to plug in a panel here and see what's going on uh, the best overloaded oh yes I forgot to write out here so that it it's referenced as an output. Um, I'm doing a terrible job here. I think I'm going to start over again. Uh, yes, this was a little confusing. I'm going to start over again. <clears throat> okay. Curve methods. Uh, divide. Okay. Okay, I'm doing a terrible job there. So I'm going to start over again. Um, okay. So, where were we? We were, um, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the first thing we're going to do is we're going to find the center points for the spheres and we're going to do that by dividing the curve into equal length segments. Um, if we go to, in Rhino Common, if we go to curve, to the curve class, we can see that the, this curve has a lot of methods, a lot of them being dividing by a, uh, a bunch of different parameters. And we can see here that when it says divide by count, uh, what we get is that we can divide the curve into a number of equal length segments. But we have two different versions. We have one 
that just takes a number and that takes a boolean and another one that takes an additional um, an additional array of points. What is the difference between them? The difference is that if we just use, for example, the first version that just takes the amount of segments and whether if we want to include the ends or not, the return type is going to be an array of doubles which represent the parameters along the line or the curve at which those points are found. Uh, so this is what we can see here. Um, and then we would need to perform a second operation where for each one of those parameters, we look at the curve and we find the point at that parameter, which is also a very simple operation that can be done. Uh, somebody thought that uh, if you were divided by count, uh, very often you also wanted not just the parameter, but you wanted the point. So they created a second overload where it's the same concept, it's the same function. You can still divide by count, amount of segments, include the ends of, and it still returns the parameters where along those lines, along that curve, uh, these centers are. But additionally, you can pass in, as a reference, you can pass in an empty array of points so that the function already gives you as well the actual points along that curve. Um, which means that in our case, because we don't really care about the parameter, we're not going to reuse that anywhere, this function is going to be much more useful for us because ultimately what we want is those points. So that's the one that I'm going to use here. So first of all, we need to make sure that we have all the parameters ready to go before we call the function. So we need to figure out how many segments we're going to divide in and we need to create an empty array to be populated. So for example, I'm going to say here, segment, I'm going to create a new variable called segment count. And this is going to be equal to the amount of pearls. So that's n minus one. Because remember, if we have a curve and we want to place three spheres, then we need to subdivide that curve into two segments. That's the amount of segments between those spheres. So it's always the amount of spheres minus one. And also, I want to create a new point 3D empty array that I'm going to call, for example, centers. And that is just going to start empty because what I want is the function to populate that uh, array with all those points. So now to the curve that was passed is a, as an input, I'm going to say, can I divide by count? And you can see here that there are two overloads. So I don't know why I'm not seeing the overloads, why they're disappearing, but anyway, so they are the ones that we saw before on the reference. So this is going to be segment count, then whether if I want the endpoints or not, I want them. And then here I'm going to pass in centers so that um, they can pre, I can get all those points. I'm going to run this. Um, I have an error. Um, if I can, I can plug in a panel here. Uh, and the error is going to be that I probably, yes, argument three must be passed with the out keyword. I forgot to write here out so that this is not an input, but it's an actual reference to that, to that object. And then if I run this code now, it's probably good. Um, just to verify that this is working correctly, I'm going to add here a dummy output, for, for example, A, and I'm going to output all those center points on the dummy output, so center, so that I can see them. Um, sorry, centers. There you go. So that I can see them on the screen. Okay. I don't really need to output them, but um, actually, why not? I could, I could, I could also make, I could also design my component to output those centers. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to do that permanently. So I'm going to rename this to uh, sense, for example, uh, sense, and then here I'm going to say centers is going to be equal to sent, and I'm going to create a new output here that I'm going to call centers. And as I run this, this has not updated. I think I should rerun it. Uh, the name centers that not exist in the centers. Uh, yes. All right. So now it's updated. Okay, cool. So 
we have the center points now and then the next thing that we need to do is we need to figure out the radius and then create spheres on top of that with that those radius so let's give that a try all right the radius of the spheres um, and then we're going to find the length of the curve which is probably something that is a is a method get length yes okay um, <clears throat> okay, the way we're going to do that is we're going to first um, calculate the length of the curve and we're going to subdivide, we're going to divide that by the amount of, um, of segments that we already computed here. But how are we going to calculate the length of this curve? Well, um, we're going to use Rhino Commons methods to find that curve because like doing it manually is pretty tedious actually. Um, so if we scroll all the way down here, we can see that curves do have this method called get length that give us return this double value, which is the length of a curve or zero if we couldn't figure it out for whatever reason. So let's say here, we're going to create a double value that we're going to call length and this is going to be equal to curve dot get length and open and close parentheses. We don't really need any argument here. Um, if we just want to make sure that this is makes sense, let's, uh, let's print something like, for example, length. Let's print this to the output here uh, of the component. So as I run this, we can see that the length of this curve is 1.1. 115 blah 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 and um, and then what we can do here is we can create another variable called segment length and this is going to be equal to the length of the curve actually let's be a little more verbose curve length uh, so that we don't confuse things uh, this is usually good practice um, what we're going to do is segment length is going to be equal to curve length divided by segment count. Uh, we could also print that here. Uh, we don't really need to. Uh, and then now what we will need to do is we will need to say sphere radius is going to be equal to segment length divided by two. Or I actually like, usually I like multiplying things by 0 0.5 so that I know I remember not to run into integrate division problems. Um, so that's the sphere of the radius of the sphere. Shall we print this out? Nah, let's give it a try. So sphere radius, oh, sorry, sphere radius. What does this look like? It looks like 4.13. I have no idea if that's a good or a bad value, but we're probably going to see as soon as we create the spheres. All right. And uh, so the next thing is create spheres on centers. And how are we going to do this? Well, we're probably going to implement something where we create an empty array. And for as many points as we have, uh, we create spheres uh, with that radii. So what do we need to create a sphere? So if I say sphere as equal new sphere, what parameters do I need? I need the center and I need a radius. Um, so those I already have. So Let's create an array of spheres. Uh, for example, I'm going to call it S. Um, and um, uh, no, I'm going to call it SPH. And this is going to be a new array of spheres which an am with an amount that is going to be equal to how many centers do we have here. So we're creating an empty array. Um, and we're populating it where we're, we're, we're reserving however many slots we need here given the amount of uh, centers. And then with a for loop, I'm going to say for, I'm going to say int i is less than zero, i is equal to the length of 
their centers array and I++. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a sphere S that is going to be equal to a new sphere with the center being each one of the centers, so sense I, and then the radius be the value that I calculated before. So that's going to be sphere radius. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to place that sphere that I just created in the new array SPH. So the element in position I in this array is going to be equal to that new sphere that I just created. And now the outputs is are going to be those centers and the spheres are going to be SPH. And as I run this code, oh, that's, I got a typo there. This has to be spheres. And then as I do that, um, it looks like we have uh, all those spheres nicely distributed uh, along, along the, um, along the, along the curve. Okay. And, um, I think that's pretty much it for this algorithm. I think this should be enough. Yeah, that should probably be enough. Um, Arasto, why use an array instead of a list? Um, for no particular reason, um, in general, you want to use lists when you don't know how many elements you're going to end up with. Um, so in general, arrays are a little faster and a little more optimized than lists. So you want to use arrays when possible, as opposed to lists. Uh, however, in C sharp world, and these days, they're almost already like very equally performative. Arrays are still a little better, but um, uh, lists are, are, pretty, are pretty fine too. You, you want to use arrays when you know how many elements you're going to end up with, because when you create the array, you have to define the size of the array. Whereas you want to use lists when you don't really know how many elements you're going to end up with, or if during your algorithm, the size of the list is going to expand or decrease. If you know that it's always going to be a particular size, then you also probably want to use arrays. They're just faster, a little faster and more optimized. All right. <clears throat> um, so divide by distance, we don't really have divide by distance. Um, and uh, in order to do that, we would need to uh, do, um, we're going to have to implement a sphere. Oh, that's not going to be straightforward. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we're going to, in order to implement the second version, we're going to have to do, we're going to have to create a sphere, compute the intersection with the curve, figure out which one is greater, and then do that iteratively. Um, that's going to take a little bit of time and mental space. Should we do that today, or should we just call it? Um, let me take a look at the sphere curve. Uh, Rhino common sphere curve intersection. Curve intersection classes. We are going to need to do we're going to have to do B reps and curves that's not a very nice experience <laughs> curve intersections mm. 
curve, curve, curve surface. Surface sphere, line sphere, plane sphere, sphere sphere, or two surfaces. Yeah, because those are mathematical. Uh, when it comes to a curve, a sphere is basically just a B-rep. Can I turn a sphere into a B-rep? Is that something that sphere structure? Can I turn this into a B-rep to B-rep? Converts this sphere into a B-rep representation. And then curve B-rep intercepts a curve with a B-rep. Intersection, tolerance, tolerance, and returns the intersection parameters on the curve. Okay. Yeah, we can do this. This is going to be a little tedious. Curve divide equidistance. Rafael, is that true? Am I making a mount equidistant? Calculate three points on a curve where the linear distance between the points is equal. Ah, you're right. That is true. I thought we were going to do this we're going to have to do this manually. Good call, Rafael. <laughs> okay. Well, that makes this much easier. Um, is that true? So, what was the what was the value that we got before diameter eight? Uh, so, if we do that curve and then the diameter. And then we plug this in here. Uh, segment count is going to divide. Div <coughs> mm -hmm. And this gives me the 0.3D objects already. So if we do this, curve, divide, equidistant, sorry, divide, equidistant and then d is going to be d which needs to be by the way it needs to be a double i'm just testing things out i'll record the video uh, and then sphere is those spheres here and why am i not sphere radius does not exist um sphere radius so th this is the right you divided by two. Oh, we got it. Yep, that was pretty simple. Um, okay, that was much simpler than I thought it was going to be. I was going to do it manually <laughs> uh, with intersections, which could be a really interesting exercise, by the way. Um, all right, so okay, so let's just do it. So let's just do it then. <clears throat> Good call, Rafael. Thank you. Okay, and the second part of the algorithm, the one where we control uh, the radius of the um, of the um, of the spheres, is going to be actually easier. I actually thought it was going to be more difficult, but um, uh, Rafael in the chat just pointed me to a function that is going to make things much easier. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to uh, deactivate the preview on this one, and I'm going to copy and paste here. I'm going to do a couple changes. So first of all, I'm going to say, I'm going to create a slider here that is going to be the diameter. Uh, so this is going to be D, so I'm going to change that name. This is going to be the diameter of the, of the sphere, and then here, I'm going to maintain the two outputs, the center and the spheres, um, but I'm going to remove a couple things here. Uh, also, I forgot to do something. You see, the input, it's still an integer and it needs to be a double. So I'm going to right click here 
and say this is a double. Um, so I'm going to follow the same principle. First, I'm going to find the center points for the spheres, and then I'm going to create spheres on those centers. So, but before we needed to compute the sphere radius, now it's just going to be as easy as um, using the value of d. So just so that I can reuse this code here, I'm going to create a variable called sphere radius, and I'm going to give it the value of d. Okay. Uh, just for the sake of reusing this code without changing it. Uh, I could also just, actually, I probably just want to replace this with, uh, sorry, no, actually, this is going to be d point, so 0 0.5 times d or d divided by 2. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing is that I, now I need to find the centers uh, of these, the centers where the spheres are going to be. But remember, uh, as per the previous video, uh, now what we want is to, want to make sure that the, all the spheres are perfectly tangent to each other, they only touch in one point, and then therefore the subdivision method that we need to use is a different one. Uh, curves also have this other method called divide equidistance. Um, that was the one that I was uh, offered uh, by Rafael in the chat. I, I was actually going to do this manually. <laughs> but um, this one gives us 3D points on a curve that have where the linear distance between those points is equal. So what we can do now is, and it's just as simple as calling divide equidistance, what is the distance? So that's going to be the diameter. And then it gives us in return a, an array of 3D points. So very easy. I'm just going to create an array of 3D points. And I'm going to call it sense as I did before. And then this is going to be equal to the result of the operation of from the curve calculating the divide equidistant and here fitting in the diameter so the value of d and then as i do that this should be now as easy as well i'm going to turn on the visualization and now you can see that these all these spheres are perfectly tangent to each other right we still have the leftover here um, i'm going to here i'm going to you see how as i reduce the radius more pearls start popping us as soon as there's room on them. Um, so, yep. So, all right. So we got the algorithm ready, and uh, and that's probably that's probably it. Uh, first, we have subdivided by uh, the amount of spheres that we want, and then we have also created the algorithm where we subdivide given the diameter and we make sure that they're perfectly tangent to each other. Uh, this works in 3D as well. And, um, and I think that's it for this video. In the next one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine these two constraints. So I'm going to create a, an, an algorithm where um, I'm going to, I'm going to make, I'm going to place, I'm going to use as parameter the amount of spheres and, uh, and I'm going to use uh, generative optimization to make sure that I can find what the optimal radius for these spheres is so that we have as little leftover curve as possible, so that the spheres fit their curve as best as possible. Okay, so um, if you like what you see, just click subscribe, etc., etc., and then um, and then follow up on the third part of this video. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> okay, and the uh, intro video, intro part for this video, I need to record that. Hi, and welcome to part two of this algorithmic modeling video where we are continuing with the exercise we did in the previous one, where we are populating, um, where we're populating a thread, which a bunch of pearls. So we're creating a, we're blah, 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 blah. starting over. Hi, and welcome to part two of this video where we are designing pearl 
necklaces or uh, a different way of saying it we're just populating a curve with a bunch of spheres uh, with some particular rules uh, in this one as we did before we have implemented an algorithm where we can control how many uh, spheres do we populate over the curve with an exact number but we have the problem that because uh, the, the because of the algorithm that we're using we know that the pearls fill all the curve all the way till the end but in some areas where the angle is very concave uh, these pearls overlap a little bit so we've also implemented another version where we can control the diameter of those spheres and we can control the fact that they are perfectly um, that they're perfectly tangent to each other however we have the problem that there is a little bit of uh, leftover here at the curve uh, but we will figure out how to combine all those constraints in the next video where we're going to do a little bit of uh, iterative optimization on this algorithm. In this video we're implementing these two rules. We're doing those in native C sharp components. So we're going to be using Rhino common and C sharp scripting. Uh, so if you're this is a beginner level so I'm going to explain everything very carefully. And um, but if you're interested in learning how to move from Grasshopper to C sharp scripting within Grasshopper, this will be a very useful video for you. Okay, so let's get to it. All right, and I think I'm done for today. Because, uh, yeah, I don't have time to do the other video that I was planning, of course, as usual. <laughs> okay, and. Uh, Okay. Oh, 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 the other challenge. Okay. So let me close things up a little bit here. Okay. And I'm going to turn on. Uh, yes. Record everything. Save everything. Yes. And coding challenges. Oh, uh, the sketchbook. <clears throat> How are you guys doing there? You're holding on? Uh, yeah, intersections are tricky at C-sharp, but they're also very powerful. Uh, it's just that it's a little messy to write them, but they're, they're very nice. Uh, I also forget the, the shortcut for indentation. I think it's Ctrl KC or something like that. Um, I guess the reason for your C-sharp uh, is the position of your mouse. If the mouse hovers over the pop-up, it makes it go away. Really? Is that so? Well, that sucks. Um, all right, let me open. No, nope, this is not the one. Oh, yeah. So I am going over. Remember when we did Chalkin's Ch 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 algorithm? Um, to find smooth curve? Okay. So this is part of the, what the challenge is going to be today about. Uh, okay, so real quick, I'm going to announce the second challenge for this week. Maybe we do one week and then we leave this one for the second week. Um, yeah, so that we don't overflow people. Um, but I'm going to announce this challenge and then we can do five minutes of uh, Q&A and social. So... Um, <clears throat> Uh, okay, and then what we're going to do is, okay, I'm just going to explain it here. Um, all right, Hody, and welcome to another coding challenge <laughs> announcement. So we are on, what is it today? Today is July 26th, okay, so this is going to be a challenge for the next two weeks okay so I'm I already did a challenge I already announced a challenge for that we're going to solve next weekend so this one is going to be for in two weekends so the weekend of the 8th and the 9th which by the way I think I'm away uh, <laughs> so I either will record on Friday or I will just record the weekend after anyway the challenge is going to be the following remember uh, geometry gem number eight i think we just did made it recently where we implemented chicken's algorithm for polyline smoothing 
So remember that in this algorithm, we started from a set of points that we, that we named the control polygon. And then from those points, we were able to find a smooth curve that <clears throat> approximated that polyline, all right? However, um, one thing that this, we could say that this algorithm is not great at is that what we need to tell the algorithm is we need to give it the control points. So this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. And, but we know based on the algorithm that the curve is never going to touch those points. And if we were doing something like robotics or path planning or like autonomous vehicles or whatever, maybe what we wanted would be something where we say, I want, I want the car or my robot to go, I want my robot to touch this point, this point, this point, and this point. And we want to find a smooth path that goes through all those points so that we can tell the robot like, move this way, move this way, move this way, etc., etc. So the challenge here is how can we use Chekin's algorithm but to create this smooth path, but instead of starting from the control points, so the control polygon, starting from a set of points that we want the curve to go through. That is the challenge. So how do we write an algorithm that does that? Um, this algorithm is also a sa the same way of phrasing this algorithm is saying, how can we, from starting from some points that we want the curve to go through, how can we create the control polygon that we can then feed into Chaikin's algorithm so that I know that that control point gives me a curve that is going to end up passing through those points. Okay? How does that sound? Is it exciting? <laughs> this is a very, this is actually a very, very interesting problem. Uh, again, because in robotics and in path planning and you know, or like uh, even in digital fabrication, if you want to create like a smooth curve, uh, but you know that there are some anchor points that you need to fix your piece in the facade, etc. You know, um, starting from those points is a very important part when you create your shape, right? So, um, so yeah, so this is the challenge. From a set of points, can you create the control polygon that is going to be then fed into Chekin's algorithm so that the curve passes through those points exactly? And, um, I'm going to go full disclaimer on this one. I have not tried this. I have not written the code. I don't know if it works or not, but I have some intuitions and some tips, okay? First of all, the way I just announced this challenge, so can we start from uh, these four points and create the control polygon for the check for check-ins algorithm? This problem is too open-ended and it has infinite solutions. I believe so. So we need to add some additional constraints. And let me let me see let me let me show you why that could be the case. Um, just like imagine we don't have this control polygon, right? So we could I could off the top of my head, I could just draw like a bunch of for example, this could be a control polygon. This one, this one, this one, and this one. Another one could be this one, this one this one and this one. Another one could be this one, this one, this one, and this one. So there are, I believe, infinite solutions to this problem. Okay. The simple answer to this is, well, if we add a constraint, we need to add constraints. Okay. So if we add a constraint, like for example, I know that the first point of the Chaikin's algorithm is this one, then I think the problem is finite or there is a, um, there is a, there is a closed form solution to this algorithm because now we know that we can just create this line here and we know that this distance has to be the same as this distance. And therefore we have the initial point here. We can create another line here because we know that these two distances must be the same. Another point here and these two distances must be the same, etc., etc. right? So if we define what is the first point, 
then the problem has a closed form. So if you don't know where to start, start trying that version. Um, but I do want the big challenge could be what if instead, what if we don't constrain it so much? What if, if we constrain it so that we know the direction, so we know the tangency of that curve at the beginning, but we don't know if the point is here, 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 here. And therefore, we create different versions of this curve, you know? The question would be, how can we write an algorithm that given the tangency at the beginning, um, decides from all the possible control polygons, which one is the more optimal? And what more optimal means, I leave that up to you, the viewer, whether if it means that the, I don't know, the total length of this segment, but this segment, but this, the total length of those segments is the smallest possible, or if the angle between the contrast polygon averages the minimum, or I don't know. But I'm going to leave that up to you, okay, as an exercise. I will probably, when I implement this myself, I will probably start with the constrained version, so the one that where we have the starting point, and because that has a closed form solution, and then perhaps we could try the other one where we have the direction vector, and then we figure out um, an iterative way of finding um, um, optimized control polygons there. Okay, so that's going to be the challenge for the next couple of weeks. Uh, it's a really interesting problem and one that has a lot of real good practical applications. So there you go. Have fun with that. <laughs> uh, all right. And I think I'm ready. I think with this, we're ready for Q&A and some social. Um, uh, the people from the Digital Futures Intelligence Theory Seminar. Which seminar was that? Uh, who were those people, Digital Futures? Digital Futures Intelligence Seminar. Uh, <laughs> no, this is us. <laughs> can you post the link to that? Rafael, can you post the link to that on the live channel? Uh, or the link to the Discord, if anybody wants to join that conversation as well. Sadly, though, it's been overlapping with your Saturday morning live streams. Uh, I know. I know, I just, I wish I could do the live streams during the week, but I'm just, I just can't do it right now. Um, I'm very busy. Uh, Neil Lich and Antoine Picon. Uh, okay. <clears throat> uh, I wonder, was that a, an Asia Pacific? Can you, Rafael? Can you share a link to that Discord on the live channel, please? <clears throat> streaming, what does streaming mean? Uh, ah, theory here, intelligence, uh, I see. Oh, I took a class, I've taken classes. <laughs> I've actually taken classes with the three, with Neil, with Antoine, and with Sanford, <laughs> each one, each one of them very interesting in their own way. <laughs> uh, okay. <clears throat> All right. So, if there are no other questions or or chitty chatter, I think we're probably ready to start the weekend. Are we? I have a long weekend in front of me. Well, that's not true. Um, I have <clears throat> I have some work to do, but um, but I can probably get it done sooner than later, hopefully. All right. Well, then that's it. Thank you very much, all of you. Uh, oh, I see. 
Well, that's a lot of people. Oh, I see. General Digital Futures Intelligence. Uh, I'm gonna bibliography suggestions. Uh, general ah Roberto. I think he's been here as well. Uh, unsorted notes, Neil. Workshops links. City Berlin. I don't know what this is about. Uh, <clears throat> calls and announcements. Uh, events. City Cairo. All right. Archive. Leech. Lectures. <laughs> this is good. All right. All right. Sounds good. Okay. So I, th I guess I'm going to take off. Uh, I need to have lunch and I have a meeting at one. So thank you very much, everyone, as usual. It was a pleasure. Um, have a good afternoon, evening, morning, weekend, uh, week, whatever. <laughs> whatever you're starting with. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.